Okay, hello and welcome here for the uh, finishing of this uh, program, Price It Escapes, uh, where over one, one year and a half we work together for, for Polytechnic University uh, was and is a very interesting project in which uh, our professors, our students uh, connect with, uh, connect, was connected with uh, designers with you and work together uh, for having, uh, uh, in fact, uh, a new, I, I hope, a new vibe regarding the conference between art and technology. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, this year when we celebrate, uh, and this will be uh, Saturday, 100 years from the first building of our campus, we launch together with this, uh, with this project the uh, concept regarding uh, our creative campus. Uh, I'm very glad to have you here and to, to have a discussion and interconnect on our project and we have together project. I'm very sure that we'll continue this together and uh, to, we'll have next projects in, uh, in next years. And this is very important because this will follow after the the year of Capital of Culture. It's very important for our university. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words. Um, I also welcome you uh, on behalf of Faber. Um, I would like to start by thanking um, Azur for hosting us in this former production space. Uh, we decided to come here today for this final lecture as a connection point uh, to how this program started. We started uh, through a really intensive and uh, quite serious uh, body of research coordinated by Norbert Petrovic here, together with his team. Um, and we started by opening the doors of factories in Timisoara. Azur is one of the factories that, uh, who, whose doors we opened together with others uh, like Hamilton, Flex, Continental, Nokia. So we, we visited lots of these uh, factories and interacted with their employees, employers, and um, looked through the data that they provided us for this, this research that we did at the beginning. So this is an important uh, point and moment for us. Uh, we had three exhibitions during this program, one of which you can still visit up until Saturday. And we gathered here today um, to underline once again the importance between um, the importance of the connection between parts within this very specific urban context. And when I say parts, I mean the reality of this city, which is this very um, present um, industrial vibe, which we can see as we are in this space, but we can see it throughout the city. We see it also in our university. We have a really strong uh, academical field oriented towards engineering in this city. So we're trying to connect the reality of this place with its potential, uh, working with uh, professional creatives of all sorts, which we basically called designers throughout this program. We will start the day uh, with uh, three uh, talks. One uh, uh, held by Norbert Petrovic, our head uh, researcher and the coordinator of the research. Uh, next, we will have uh, Saskia Van Stein, who's the director of the um, Urbanism Biennale in Rotterdam, also an architect. Uh, we will then meet Joseph Grimma, also architect, uh, the director of the Design Academy Eindhoven, so already here we have um, a bridge between two very different realities. After the three speeches, we will have a, a debate, which will be uh, moderated by Stefan Gedjulescu, head of the Zeppelin magazine in Bucharest, another architect in the room. <laughs> um, and uh, Stefan will uh, bring together the three speakers uh, with uh, Mihaela Sikim, representing the local industry, uh, Hamilton more specifically, which was a, a company which we involved uh, in the exhibition. They have a work within the Turn Signals exhibition together with Theophile Blande. And uh, Simona Fitz, who is the mayor's advisor on uh, culture. 
Uh, in terms of practicalities, uh, as I'm sure you all received these blue fire, uh, flyers, <laughs> we are in a um, functioning factory facility, so please don't wander around. When you want to leave, just uh, leave straight out. Don't wander within the perimeter of the factory. Um, the toilets are at the entrance in the building. I will ask you please to uh, have your coffee during the break, because as you notice, the sound is a bit disturbing for the conferences. Uh, and after the three speeches, speeches, we will have a short break and then we will go to the uh, round table and to the debate where we are looking forward also to receive your questions. So that's the part where we also have a dialogue. So please pre prepare for that. That being said, I would like to invite Norbert with us here. Um, and I'm looking forward to see his presentation. My counter. Okay. I will have uh, the task. I don't know if it's very vis visible. Uh, I have a lot of charts and some interviews. Um, my point uh, I will try to cover some main questions uh, or the task for me uh, set up by the team was to cover a little bit of the economic uh, history of Timishara and to uh, uh, cherry pick those elements that uh, are actually influencing the current economic structure. Then to talk a little bit about the current structure of the economy. And uh, then I will uh, discuss uh, our current research with our team, uh, how wages were managed in Timisoara and how actually it's linked with economic growth uh, and spatial development of the city. Uh, the historical question, uh, I will start the presentation not as I should from the Habsburg uh, uh, 19th century, which is certainly very important. Uh, I'm not really sure that the charts are very visible. Wanna Or maybe the light? Okay. Okay, that's it. I will tell you what's in the pictures. Um, so here it's a map of 1930s, uh, when uh, Timisoara has an economic boom, as it uh, uh, had uh, already a decade of development within Romania, as it switched uh, uh, the boundaries, the, the main area of incorporation from the Habsburg Empire to the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire to the Romanian uh, new state. And uh, what is very specific about the economic structure of Timisoara in the 1930s, with a strong uh, uh, layer put by uh, a former development, is that it was second to Bucharest in terms of number of employees in, in industry. Uh, it was uh, second in terms of uh, joint stock companies uh, and uh, in second in number of businesses after Bucharest. Chisinau had the, uh, uh, was the second after Bucharest in terms of number of, um, of individual companies after Bucharest, but Timisoara was second in terms of actually companies, not self-employed uh, uh, personnel. Um, here is a map in which uh, it's a long durée map, uh, a chart, where it starts in the 1950s and it ends in 2022, uh, where we plotted the number of unwaged workers with the blue colors, uh, those working in industries, actually those who were manually employed in various types of uh, economic sectors. And here are the white colors. The 1990s are strongly visible as uh, the historical trend of unwaged workers uh, suddenly was uh, halted. And we have a strong retro-migration uh, in the countryside. 
uh, from Timisoara in larger cities and the uh, sizable uh, employment uh, as uh, uh, working in agriculture. Uh, the blue colors uh, expanded a lot when then contracted, while the white colors, this is quite interesting, exploded after 2003, after the Romania was macroeconomically uh, stabilized and economic growth uh, kicked in. Uh, after 2011, when a lot of uh, foreign investment capital uh, once again came in uh, Transylvania and Banat, and also in uh, Bucharest and Oltenia. Here is probably invisible, but I will tell you the story. During socialism, um, there were two important trends uh, with big consequences. On the one hand, there are the economic sectors in Timisoara, and the economic sectors uh, in Timish County, actually, uh, received, comparing with the Romanian national context, disproportionately more investment and more employees in agriculture compared with any other uh, region in Romania. That's quite intriguing uh, because what, it's, what has to be underlined here is that it's waged workers that work in agriculture. That is, the agriculture in Timisoara was highly mechanized and the investments were uh, strongly oriented towards uh, uh, production for, uh, for exports and for Romania. The second one here, it's a zoom in just on an industry. Uh, and the industry, they were compared with Romania, several major areas that where uh, Timisoara received disproportionately more investments and had more employees du during socialism. That is in chemical sector, construction, textile, and leather, food, and printing. These were very important uh, sectors where Timisoara excelled comparing with the rest of the country. Why this has major impact is because uh, at the end of socialism, uh, while the blue color exploded and the agriculture uh, became uh, smaller and smaller, it, it became actually more uh, contained and mechanized. And the, the way the economy of Timisoara worked was that the, there were short circuits of supply chains from agriculture to industry, local links, that created a, long, a strong local economy, uh, well contained within the region and within the economic uh, landscape of Romania. However, uh, Romania was exporting a lot both in the 70s and in the 80s. I, I can show you that, but it's another presentation. And Timish was a leading region from where exports were coming from. That is, many of these sectors were actually oriented towards export. The current situation, these are data from 2008 and 2022. Uh, Timisoara excels in manufacturing, comparing with the rest of the rest of Romania, uh, and for a short period during the 2008 boom in construction, but that's not the case anymore. Uh, and uh, retail, especially in the last three years, uh, and, and the logistics, which were once again a key sector for development in uh, for Timisoara. The effect is a very specific type of composition of the workforce. Uh, you, you cannot see probably there. ITC is the leading uh, sector of employment along with engineering in terms of professionals. The two categories together make up 30,000 employees, which is uh, similar uh, to the IT sector and engineering sector in Cluj or Iași. Obviously, it's dwarfed by Bucharest, 
But nonetheless, what is very specific to Timisoara is a strong background uh, in terms of engineering. Uh, and a more balanced uh, composition in that sense comparing to Cluj. Uh, here it's a map of the specificities of today's economy. economy. Specifically, automotive uh, is the leading sector by far in Timish. While sectors like ITC are quite important, they are lagging behind comparing with the national uh, national, national developments. But that's a little bit of a misnomer because many of the ITC workers, and I will back, come back to that, are actually working in industries and they are uh, working within factories and that's why they are not seen distinctively as a, a sector. Here it's a map where you can see that Timish received from 2000s a lot of investment and also the uh, western part of Romania of FDI, foreign development investments. And uh, Timiș uh, and Arad were uh, systematically the leading regions in terms of investments along Bucharest uh, for FDI. And here I make a short synthesis and the argument is as follows. Uh, 50% uh, the FDI companies uh, has, uh, in terms of ownership, there are only 6% of the whole economic landscape. Nonetheless, 70%, uh, 69% of the total turnover, it's created or it works within the multinational companies. And uh, two thirds of the employees are working in multinationals. Also, the total turnover of um, the metropolitan area uh, represents more than any other region except Bucharest. Uh, that's quite important. Uh, and the industrial sectors is 50% uh, of uh, the total turnover, uh, which is very unique for Romania. There are other regions in Romania that are similar, but they do not have the engineering capacities. Now we'll contextualize a little bit this development uh, within the economy of uh, uh, Timisoara, especially because the wages uh, had an incredible growth. And I will tie the current predicament, the, how it works, the economy, with a longer history. And the way we will do that, I will try, <laughs> let's see if I can, read you some interviews uh, comparatively. We compared uh, factories from Cluj, from Zalău, nearby Cluj, and Timisoara. And I will read first those near Cluj, that is more pre precisely uh, near Zalo. I am unmarried and I am unmarried and childless, currently residing with my parents. Although I possess a separate house, I occasionally stay there alone, while also assisting my parents with household chores, tending to their land and caring for their animals, including chickens, pigs, cows, approximately 20 rabbits. We are largely self-sustaining, producing food from our own garden on arable land, mainly cultivating crops such as corn, wheat, and potatoes. While my father is self-employed in an auto workshop, my retired grandfather actively tends to the animals. My brother, who spends significant time in Germany, also lends a hand when he's in the country. We have consistently maintained a presence of animals on our pri property, primarily for personal consumption which has allowed us to reduce our reliance on store-bought meat, milk, and eggs. I contribute to the household expensive, covering items like water, electricity, television, in addition to my tax taxes. My income has ranged from approximately around 700 euros during my early career, and now it's 
8,000 that uh, lay, that's around 1,600 euros. Uh, during the uh, period of extensive work, uh, resulting in a reasonable average income. That's, that's quite a lot. Uh, this is an operator near Zalau. And now I will read the same type of interviews in, uh, in Timisoara and uh, what we discussed with the workers. This is a family that's living in Timisoara and employed in uh, the factory. I'm married and my husband also employed. I have somewhat balanced setup where one salary goes primarily towards our everyday expenses and the other covers things like gas for the car. Our children have settled in Germany, so we don't have much in terms of economic exchanges and with them. We have a house in the countryside. But we are not planting or farming. It's hard to do agriculture in your spare time. It's just not something I enjoy. This is a recurrent, recurrent tea theme for Timisoara. We would expect it coming from Cluj to have workers engage in agriculture systematically. We did not find everyone here were talking that agriculture cannot be a pastime activity. Another one, a rural worker, uh, living in a rural household. We don't have any other sources of income. We own some land, but we don't cultivate it. We also have a few chickens because we don't have the time to take care of more animals and the feed can be the fodder here. It can be expensive. This is very unusual for the other factories where this is cheap, it's produced in the household to what you feed to your animals. There are times when we run short of money and we end up borrowing from my mother-in-law. Uh, the workers in Timisoara complain systematically about their lower wages even if they have on average larger wages. Therefore, a question, key question here, it, which are the strategies that can be employed to achieve an annual wage increase in Romania ranging from 3 to 15 percent, while on the average, the wage in Romania remains half of the EU? The second, how did factories effectively manage wage increases for their employees while maintaining moderation in wage growth? And here you can see on that part, and I will tell you in words what you can see, is that on average Romania had an increase of 8% of the wage annually. That is way above the 3% of EU. However, the average wage in Romania is half of the EU wage from when we have the Eurostat data, that is from 2013, 2012. Um, and that's quite an intriguing question, how you have one of the highest growth of uh, wages in Europe, while still the salaries are half. And uh, we compare three factories, as I told you, uh, even if we did interviews in various factories, uh, Flex, Bosch, and Tenaris. And we looked at two types of wages. First, how the annual percent change uh, and the actual wages grow, grew in industry. And obviously, there is a huge growth, but nonetheless, still half of the European Union. And here are the uh, increases in the business service sector, that is the engineers, where the engineers are receiving double the wage of the workers, but still half of the European Union, and was still one of the fastest uh, growth rate in Europe. The way it actually works, uh, and this is our argument here, is that we have a shift in paradigm, generally in social sciences, 
and in a political economy where we look of, of the demand side, that is the aggregate demand uh, among businesses for labor, and also Romania included transition systematically from an export-oriented economy in the last 10 years, highly dependent on foreign investment, also went to, um, actually for, from in, uh, internal consumption to a foreign dependent investment uh, economy. That's after 2010, very specifically. And the way it actually worked, it was that the employees and the, how the economy works is that they are contained in very precise enclave economies. We explore this concept very precisely. And this uh, orient, uh, changed the priority of policies. I will show you exactly what we are trying to say. For the three factories, we mapped from where the employees are coming in the factories in terms of internal migration. You can see it, I will tell you once again what's here. For the all three factories, the major recruitment area is the city itself and the other cities from Romania. That is the white colors or internal migrants coming from other cities. More or less, these three cities are vampires <laughs> taking the talents from the other parts of the Romania. And the way it is functioning is that the university is the major filter. And from the universities are redistributed to, the, uh, to, to employment. On the other hand, the blue colors are coming from within the radius of the region in Romanian Judets and the regions uh, nearby. We plotted all workers for, for the all three factories. And here is the daily commute. In this part, you can see the white color employers, employees, and for the all three uh, regions, that is Timisoara, Cluj, and Zalo, we have for the white colors a strong suburbanization pattern that is fueled by how actually work from the new factories and the new engines of growth. On the other side is the blue colors employees and there is no suburbanization there. We, I will call that peri-urbanization that are workers that are actually employed within the factories but have a household in the rural areas. That is, in the last four years, Romania experienced an increase in the percentage of rural residents, and that's quite intriguing. Why? The answer is quite simple, because the factories are relying on daily commutes that are producing a new generation of rural workers that is commuters within the rural confines. And that's working on a very sp specific type of economy where there is a very important local agricultural production that is partially monetized in Cluj and Salaj near the factories because those type of agriculture are based on household exchanges, partially monetized, and creates alongside the factories an economy, a rural economy, growing and booming uh, economy that is based on animals, uh, vegetables, and inside uh, the household uh, intergenerational exchanges of uh, resources. While in Timisoara, <laughs> This is not happening because we have a longer history of proletarization. We have a longer history of workers who uh, are, were employed in factories that changed a lot the way family works, that is single nuclear families, less intergenerational exchanges, and that created a high pressure on the wages in Timisoara and also 
uh, makes a lot of workers, even if they have higher wages on average than the other regions, to complain about, obviously, lack of resources, even they are paid better. Because exactly this kind of economy lacks altogether, and why? Because Timisoara has an advanced agricultural business sector, highly dominated by FDI, uh, and this household economy is not really possible because it's actually highly reliant on exports and investments of foreign capital. Those sectors are not interlinked in the way the other factories are linked. Key takeaways. Timisoara historical development uh, of the industrial sector that is back from the Austro-Hungarians and uh, came with a significant boom with changing of uh, the context of the city that is from imperial, imperial to a nation, national state, which created actually for Timisoara a lot of FDI in the 1930s. That is, that is the uh, capital that were coming, coming from the Austro-Hungarian Empire which played a very important role for, significant, uh, for uh, the way the economy worked because the socialists invested a lot in various type of industry, very precise type of industry that continued that legacy and also uh, shifted the way uh, workers were employed in agriculture, blue collars. And once again, we have a boom in FDI, substantial in Timisoara after 2000 actually the most important after Bucharest, and that went in industry. However, we can see clearly that space played a key role here, how labor was managed. That's very important to underline because the understanding of historical and current spatial dynamics obviously can inform the economic policies and plays a key role here because space is used as a key mechanism for wage moderation and also for wage of for workers of ability and uh, either white colors or blue colors. Um, what are the next steps? There are clearly some. I, I, I see, them, see them. First of all, the, it's obviously from the interviews and the analysis that uh, there is a, a worth exploring the emerging technologies in Timisoara. The factories, uh, often they are categorized as factories, as continental, as industrial, but actually it's not. And uh, we started the research where we look at uh, Bosch uh, and several other companies' patents. Timisoara obviously has most patents in Romania, <laughs> uh, but they are not uh, recorded in Timisoara, but in Berlin, in Germany actually. And that's quite important once again. Uh, to see how this kind of relation works. Then uh, the collaborative innovation, one of the key elements that in these factories uh, we saw that while there are advanced technologies, many of the uh, advanced services for engineering and design are lacking as independent startups on an uh, independent ecosystem. That's once again, it's a key point uh, as managers of multinational companies who are mentioning in interviews exactly that they cannot externalize this kind of uh, advanced type of design. Then obviously another point is the sustainable economic development as uh, we were introduced in the beginning. In terms of, uh, Timisoara has a lot of factories, <laughs> space, and most of it they are, trans are transformed today in new are important. And another part, part important here is the design scene. Um, we can clearly saw uh, uh, production innovation and design driven thinking in the companies. But these companies are working at shared service centers, at captive centers. And uh, most of the time they do not have an autonomy to create a local booming, independent, autonomous sector that works together with this sector. Um, 
Obviously, one of the greatest issues for all the cities in Romania is the talent attraction and retention because the smaller cities are trying to fight back. Uh, and they are becoming a very clearly aware of the huge issues of drainage, internal drainage of talents, and the fact that these cities are capable of keeping the talents while suburbanizing them. So it's a, <laughs> it's a two movement within the region and in the suburbs. And uh, investment in collaboration opportunities, while um, one of the key issues in our research that came time after time, in, especially in the interviews, and also gathering the data, is that most of the collaborations of employees are strongly um, linked within or co uh, contained within the factories or the companies, or between the companies across location, Bosch Cluj with Bosch Timisoara and the Bosch Juku or Blaj, but not between companies, and that's almost impossible because the shared service centers are uh, servicing the multinational headquarters. Obviously, they were not going to create this kind of uh, transition, except, and this is quite, was quite intriguing, uh, except uh, the fact that the employees are circulating between factories. And I found out this joke that everyone knows in Timisoara. Uh, apparently, I, I, I was not aware. Their future, no, their former, uh, current, and future employees of Continental in Timisoara. Um, that is, they are very precise companies that are this kind of linking points of talents. On the other hand, the blue colors, we also investigated that, there are strong barriers for intercompany movement. It's done with the wages and other institutional aspects. Okay, this is where my 30 minutes, thank you. Thank you very much, Norbert. You will find the full research that Norbert and his team uh, did for this project on the brightcityscapes.eu platform in a PDF format, also nicely designed with the help of our team. I would like to invite next uh, Saskia Van Stein. As I told you, Saskia is an architect. Uh, she moderates, she writes, she teaches, but most importantly, she's the director of the um, Urbanism Biennial in Rotterdam. So I'm looking forward to your story, Saskia. Thank you. <clears throat> 30 minutes for me too. Ooh, the echo. I'll try and speak slow. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Noana, Martina, Faber, um, UPT. Lovely to meet all of you. Thank you, Norbert and Joseph. Look forward to the conversation uh, under guidance of Stefan. I've been asked to speak about um, my practice. And I am from the Netherlands, so I think it's important to maybe frame that position. I speak from the Northern European context. Who's been in Holland? Anybody? Ah, okay. Five, six hands, that's nice. Um, I was already introduced. I'll try and uh, work with the rush. I have five projects to share, and I will finalize with maybe some perspectives on where I think this idea of the bright cityscape will go. What are the narratives that we'll be facing? I was recently appointed um, as director of the International Architecture Biennial, and um, the biennial has, is two decades old. So it's 20 years of legacy that I'm uh, uh, currently embracing and I'm very happy that we just have our new website. Um, and uh, what we do is every two years we make a biannual, so that's basically an exhibition program. We organize events and uh, we facilitate research. Um, these are the topics that we basically embrace. I'll get into that a bit later on, but large scale societal objects and how architecture, design and landscape can anticipate um, 
either by getting into the problematics or visualizing alternatives. As mentioned, I'm also um, by now a co-head of department of the Critical Inquiry Lab, where young students, in fact, delve into the research um, as a practice. So really, uh, maybe bringing the visuals to your story is like, what does that imply, literally, all these data and all these knowledge? Lastly, I moderate a lot of debates, and um, I'm doing a PhD in Walt Disney and identity production. Now, maybe you know that Walt Disney was uh, an ambulance driver in the First World War in northern France. And I'm very intrigued to see what he, what he took as inspiration uh, to take back to the US for, for, for a whole narrative. And I'm also intrigued that you see uh, he has quite some, um, let's say, architectural or urbanistic ambitions, truly. But unfortunately, this lecture is not about Walt Disney. Um, as said, five projects. I have worked for about uh, nine years for the Netherlands Architecture Institute, uh, very roughly an institute that shelters um, all the archives and the history of, um, of urbanism in the Netherlands. And every two years they are asked to make the entry for the Venice Biennial. Now, the Venice Biennial, I think you all know, stems from this tradition of um, bringing the legacy of the best uh, to the world, the nation pavilions. It's a great honor as a young curator to curate this. In this particular case, it's a bit of an older project, but I thought because we're talking about uh, industry and how industry and property are interlaced and how possibly they can be um, catalyzing a different discourse, I thought Vacant and L, where architects meet um, ideas would be a nice one. So you see the, uh, the Dutch pavilion and when I was invited to curate it, we were just uh, recovering from the Lehman crisis. So the promise of money that in fact did not do what it ought to do. We can get into the financial system later on. But that resulted in 20%, um, 22% of the Dutch buildings being vacant. So a lot of empty buildings, on the one hand as speculation objects, on the other hand literally because there was no fuel in the machine called our society. While also the population was in decline. We're a country of 17 and a half million. The projections were that around 2000 we'd have 20 million people, but we never made it past that 17 and a half. Well, at the same time, Populism is rising, so you see that the rhetoric is then projected on to um, the, the migrants because they are, of course, always part of the problem. I'm being cynical for, the, for those of you who are not uh, picking up on it. So, zooming into the, to the beautiful uh, Giardini, uh, Rietveld, uh, one of our icons of modernity, designed this beautiful Dutch pavilion. It's uh, as elegant as can be. But of course, the Biennale is only open three months a year, or it was. It now is by now, I think, half a year open every biennial. But um, the Dutch Pavilion in and of itself was a vacant building. So what we basically did was illustrate that for 40 years, this building has just been standing there and picked up on that notion to question what will we do with all these empty buildings, in this case, Dutch government property buildings that are standing vacant. Again, populism on the rise, culture funding on the lows. So we created an empty pavilion. I say we because it's a project that I did together with Raaf, Barbara Visser, Joost Grotens and Jurgen Bij. We worked on it for one and a half year and if you see it you think, but simple but not simplistic, I hope at least. And what you are looking at is a turn, a turn in society. So in our case, industry is changing, um, the, the, the secular um, society is on the rise. So you see a lot of large buildings, a lot of churches are vacant. Um, so our question was, can we understand this as public space in reference of the Nolimap? And uh, we provided an atlas 
of potentiality. So how can we use these vacant spaces? Where are they in our cities? Um, we really outlined a whole iconographic potentiality in um, how they could be used alternatively, because mind you, there's a lot of economy going into these buildings. And then networking these buildings to people and their practices. So how did people get together in these? Uh, because it's still about um, where ideas are born. And we had a little giveaway booklet with uh, the best of practices uh, of that moment. So that's one of the projects that I worked on. And um, it really was quite interesting to see that doing something in Venice mirrored back to the Dutch uh, newspapers with quite a force. Uh, it was as if the mirror from outside, I now see the booklet, but the mirror from outside shines brighter than uh, within. And this was also the period that we had a new king, and all of a sudden our new king started to introduce the rhetoric, we are a do-democracy. And I thought, okay, are we? Are we? Are we truly emancipated citizens? Are we consumers? Are, what is the rhetoric behind his do-democracy? Is it austerity or not? Because again, it was still the Lehman crisis, and I was in this period of time director of a museum in Maastricht. And this is uh, the city of Maastricht, you might know from the signing of the treaty in 1992, uh, to, let's say, kiss to birth uh, the European Union, but it is in Maastricht where our industrialization started. It was connected to the River Meuse, and through the River Meuse, there was also a lot of resources, and it was the beginning of the uh, Sphinx Empire, which is a sanitation, uh, anything to do with washing your hands and toilets, and they greatly benefited from the fact that the Dutch government was neutral during First World War, and they produced a lot, and then after the First World War, uh, the sanitation wave came in terms of hygiene and sewer systems, and. Um, this is what it, that looked like. Again, turn of the century. I'm always struck by the division of men and women already in the labor force. Uh, but that is what I found. And this particular, it's five hectares. Uh, this is what they projected, but because of the same Lehman crisis, it, w it never happened. So uh, nature had just taken over in an inner city that was very densely populated. So we asked the alderman, can we have the key? Can we use it for one year, a temporary park? Uh, so we made a nice logo and uh, opened it up, literally. And um, we provided just the basics for people to take over, to say, OK, we are a do democracy, but what do you want to do? Do you want to do you have an idea what you want to do with your neighbors? Or And um, there it was really incredibly heartwarming to see that uh, people started organizing poetry readings. Uh, this was the smallest gallery ever. Uh, people started to produce their own food. And we always asked that you would do something in return for the community. So uh, in this particular case, we, would, we helped uh, a prototype in our landscape. There's so much monoculture that um, the, uh, the bee the bees are better off in the inner city context because there's more diversity. But of course, that sits badly with people. So we had this seven and a half meter pole uh, where, where honey was produced. We had inner city beekeepers. Uh, um, we organized a second prototype that would go up and down on um, solar energy. We organized uh, a, a mini woodstock uh, it's just to say that if you ask people, will you join, it, it was heartwarming to see what activated this particular spot. Continuing, because I have very short time and I promised five projects. Um, when I arrived there at the biennial, there was no biennial. So I thought what is crucial in our time is that we're in a, in a position of transition. And this transition, is, in my modest opinion, being capitalized on through fear and through electoral gain in the Dutch context. And this, let's say, creation, uh, maybe rightly so, um, of fear, we should try to understand differently. 
So, with the curator team, we looked at um, this model, the world model. It is for the first time where a group of industrialists, the Club of Rome, try to understand the world as one whole, one whole integral um, entity that, through the extrapolation, these were the scientists that went into the limits to growth. Um, does anybody know this booklet, Limits to Growth? Yeah. So they were looking at literally um, the uh, natural resources, uh, food per capita, pollution, uh, population, and industrial output. And with the help of the computer, looked at 11 scenarios on where our planet would go. And it was written in uh, the 70s, it was published in 72, and it looks at the year 2072. So we're halfway, and we try to understand how, how are we doing as a planet. And um, without getting too much into uh, detail, there was one scenario that was called business as usual. If we don't do anything, then the disastrous effects will be uh, there, and that's of course the one that we are right on track of the business as usual. So everything that we tried in terms of uh, uh, the Paris Agreement and what have you, you see it gets hotter and hotter, we're living it every day, uh, so far is, uh, is failing. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, we are situated in the harbor, so a sort of similar aesthetic uh, as we see here. And um, our office is, I have to see now, oh yeah, our office is here. And all of a sudden I thought, shall I try and get into this old um, uh, gas holder? Uh, the gas holder was a ruin and um, it hadn't been used for 25 years. So to get the key, to get in, obviously being a symbol of a fossil fuel driven economy, um, that is then just standing there. So what we did, I found the key and we made an infrastructure in all of that. It's a bit hard to see, but we looked at uh, 50 years of attempts, political attempts, uh, design attempts, um, in order to generate the change that we would want to see. And that led to um, maybe just one anecdote to take from the wall. I find that quite inspirational that Jimmy Carter, he put solar panels on the White House uh, very early on in, uh, in, in 1979. Um, uh, and then of course after that Reagan comes and he immediately gets rid of the solar panels even though they're fully functioning because he then introduces the green growth narratives so that the economy and nature somehow magically will be a happy marriage is not extractivist or whatsoever. Well, it's interesting to see how then, of course, that conversation uh, gets politicized. And what we question is what kind of speed, if it's about change, should we embrace? And we had three, the accelerator, where technology um, is basically the driver of change. I won't really get into the projects, but maybe this one is a beautiful one where we look into uh, it's an installation by uh, 2050 plus that they look into uh, in vitro food making and what the consequences uh, could or, uh, or should be uh, of that. We had the activists, usually working with a local community with a particular kind of aesthetic, rather short term. Um, again, uh, and then the last one was the ancestor. That's the architect that looks back in time to get inspiration for the future or tries to take the future um, generations into consideration for the design. So these different velocities, I think, are an interesting one to talk through change and the change we're facing at the moment. Uh, that deals with material culture. Uh, here we worked with uh, students of, the, uh, of um, the Architecture Academy. And we had the Ancestor Pavilion outside by Studio Ossidiana, where we um, worked with with uh, with animals and in the arena we talked about the change that we are now facing this is a X curve by uh, professor Lorbach where you see that we are here um, so in case you feel in case you feel that chaos it's correct because 
this is the basic thinking behind systems of change. They work into deep time and then speculate on a future through, an, um, uh, in this case, the, the, uh, the breakdown of a system is what we are in, but we are not yet stabilized with the, with the next one. A lot of conversation, a youth program, guided tours, I'm going through it very, excursions, obviously. Um, maybe one word about the sonography. I found it important that we would not buy anything, so everything was very temporarily taken out of uh, a system. So in this case, we borrowed, I don't know how that would translate, but a lot of sand uh, from our municipality. Everything was very shortly taken out of a particular process in order to give it back after the exhibition space. Um, there was a light scheme uh, as if the building was breathing. The graphic identity with by Stahl R look, looking at all different warning signs and taking inspiration from that. Um, and basically we came up with the smallest manifesto for the future. And I'll just go back, so take time. I think that's something where at least I am it's very difficult to take time. Skill up, skill out, and skill deep. Connect to deep time. This is the ancestral thinking. Create context for others to blossom. Study system. Everything is connected. Root locally. Resonate globally. This is this question of the reappreciation of the local without becoming too nostalgic, possibly. Design towards desirable futures. Share value, not profit. It's, um, develop capacities rather than knowledge, think radical, act pragmatic, seize the transformative moment and act upon climate change as a short-term problem. Well, that's what it looked like. Very shortly, um, in the Dutch context, a lot of young people are having a hard time getting their first um, jobs because of the new legislation, new 2008, uh, you need a precedent, so if you want to design a school, you have to have a school on your name already. So there's a sort of catch-22, plus you need a particular um, turnover to get a certain assignment. So we wanted to catalyze that um, showing of, of uh, 100 young talents from the Northern European uh, region. And what we did is actually harvest all the wood in five kilometers around our building. And with that wood, we built literally um, uh, the exhibition uh, space. And it was also great to see all the young people get to know each other. So it's also about network building. Okay. Um, one project that I wanted to mention is that we are transitioning in Rotterdam uh, in six neighborhoods from gas to um, uh, waterstof, hydrogen uh, systems, but they are doing this in the in a neighborhood that is very poor and very diverse. It has 174 different neighborhoods, and you see that the municipality is only looking at this as a technical operation. So how can we understand these processes as cultural or as um, social operations? And we have been programming in that neighborhood for a very long time, analyzing, in fact, what could be done, because now it's a one-size-fits-all. Um, so where is the human energy? Where is the wastefulness? It uh, is a beautiful project by Ooze. We have appointed to do that a commons collective, uh, so it's not so much a curator like myself coming in, but uh, we provide the context for active citizens to take their own um, guidance there's a lot of food preparation, there's a lot of conversation, there's a lot of exchange uh, between different ethnic groups. Um, we've provided for one uh, space where they can meet. And one that I'm really quite, one of my favorite is that we have a mobile wooden oven uh, because the Moroccan women, they like to break their own bread, but they can't. So this wooden oven is actually on a different corner every week and then they can come with their dough and they make the bread together and um, it's, you can see the little fire, oops, you can see the little fire inside uh, and that's where the conversations really happen. Very small scale. Um, okay, I'm nearly done. The um, last project that we initiated um, 
is about the Netherlands, an endangered country, some of them say, because the amount of um, challenges we face with the water is somehow not addressed at the moment through politics, or the conversation is very, very slowly starting. So, we, the only political ambition there is, is in fact around the fact that we have a million houses short. So a million on 1,700, seven and a half million, so it's quite urgent. And our minister um, that will take care of this job is also the minister who took care of COVID. And um, they formed a, a cabinet, but as you can tell, there's all the different things we need to tackle in the near future are with different compartments in the government. So we were questioning how can in fact all of that come together? We need um, a real strong spatial force and ambition. So we didn't go deep fake, but we did help our minister a little bit by organizing a ministry of making. And the ministry of making takes in an analogy of, um, uh, of COVID. We have this thing called local architecture centers. So we phoned everybody, will you collaborate with us? And um, we designed a test kit, again, in analogy, and every test kit would be distributed at the door of an architect or architect team with uh, a map where they could choose the location that they wanted to work on. And that was a location of two by two kilometers, and in that they had to draw 10,000 houses. In an online environment, they could share stories, share deeper research, and with the teams, they worked on um, better soil, green, uh, implementing um, subterranean structures. This is the result, uh, 101 good ideas for the Netherlands. And what we see was the biggest uh, exhibition on, on uh, spatial planning in the Netherlands. And it really resonated with a lot of people. We did workshops and conversations on how can and how do we want to live um, in the near future. I'm again, I'm really skipping over. This brings me to, after Super Dutch, there was liter literally nearly no um, discourse in the Netherlands anymore. And I'm not saying that it's there now, but we are seeing a whole new generation uh, speaking up, reconnecting to the uh, questions that we are facing as a, as a society. Well, as said, these are the topics that we sort of touch on, water, power, uh, openness of city, the next economy, this is how endangered it probably will be in about 80 years. This could be the, the front uh, coastline of the Netherlands. As said, we really invest a lot in, in water and water management. I'm just going through very, very fast. To um, to the near future, um, because we see that, for instance, now in Chicago, the rehearsal space, um, Earth is something that's coming through. I thought, uh, where is Charja? That's opening tomorrow, or, yeah. So the beauty of impermanence. I like to look at these things, like what is on the horizon? What is coming? And it is this, maybe, this ethics of care um, for ourselves, for our environment, that we see reoccurring. Okay, so I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but I think we are all acknowledging that we're in a sort of poly crisis at the moment. And through this poly crisis, we have to come and find some new narratives and perspectives. And this is what that crisis possibly looks like. I, I find, I'm very impressed by this beautiful diagram of um, the way that architecture, or the way we have as society as a whole, maybe, um, let's say, ignored the, the values within and worked through extraction of people and material and goods too much. And how can we maybe somehow reappreciate uh, the material culture around us, so everything that's already there. So I want to bring to the table this material renaissance. So this comes with the reappreciation of the local uh, that says something about how to perceive proximity and distance, so geographies and how to maybe think in a circular manner. 
I'm nearly ending, but these are a few of the perspectives I want to bring to the conversation. So beyond waste, we see a lot of re-emergence um, and a reappreciation of bio-based material and circularity. This is, a, I think, a beautiful example by the Zwarte Hond. But what we as architects should maybe do is not only build this cross-timber laminated structures, but also think about where does this wood in fact come from? Uh, one of the beautiful projects that I recently visited was a church with a roof, and next to it, out of the same wood of the roof, was a forest. And because they were already anticipating on the fact that the roof in about 80 years would, um, would implode, there was the, the wood already there grown to rebuild the roof. Well, this kind of thinking obviously is um, about reuse, uh, reduce and recycling that also comes with awareness strategies. Well, we are sitting in a huge potentiality in terms of space, but um, I think 80% of the challenges we face have to be addressed in the existing city. So this is heat or water retention, or in this case, um, uh, one of the stars of uh, last year was the refurbishment of a former um, uh, train, train building uh, industry, and it's now a library and a restaurant and a uh, very beautifully designed by a Civic with a curtain structure by uh, inside outside that compartmentalizes the space. We see a reappreciation not so much of the concept but of the skill. So skills are being brought back. Um, a lot of collaborative, uh, so not so much the singular genius anymore but the collaborative effort. Um, that talks about how maybe to design values such as uh, belonging or th understanding the commons or what actually builds up a community. I think we all can acknowledge that individualism has thrived uh, to a moment where everybody is so fragmented at the moment that maybe we should design some rituals of togetherness, like now, but then we should have a conversation, not only me um, talking, Obviously, technology, can we shift from uh, ultimate control to systems of re relationality? I thought to bring in this diagram that has me pondering uh, the projections um, by Goldman Sachs, mind you, on uh, which jobs will in fact disappear within now and 20 years. Uh, and I think your blue collar jobs, actually, we are, we are, they are... Um, on the safe side of things because robotization is very difficult for the, to really uh, mimic labor in that sense, but cognitive labor uh, is questioned. I don't know who's following BlackRock and where they invest in, but that's very interesting to think about centralized and decentralized models. Um, connecting to the more than human. Uh, it's my first time in Romania, definitely not the last, but I do feel that in your examples also, Norbert, uh, there is this proximity to the environment much more fundamental than where I'm coming from, at least in the rural areas. So how to understand ourselves not so much above nature but within nature, that goes about talking about different species, different flows, currents and metabolism. The speculative, we need new narratives to get hope for the near future. Um, maybe even finding new languages. Um, because in the way we speak about things is already, we reproduce a particular uh, culture. And as I said, many of the students that, that uh, we work with uh, under guidance of, of, of Joseph are trying to re-articulate what does it mean to care for the self and, uh, and, the, and the environment. That brings me to my last slide. I think besides the language, we're also looking at um, a question on epistemology, like which kind of knowledge systems should we recognize or maybe try to reconnect to or understand. So um, this, this reappreciation of, of the situated knowledge, the knowledge in the hands, the tacit knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and that's not some exotic knowledge, but something that is already here. Um, and I see that many, again, of our students are, are uh, embracing uh, uh, that. And uh, I look forward to the uh, conversation to share a little bit of the magic. Uh, thank you for listening. These were my 30 minutes.
Thank you, Saskia. Um, I, would like my, I would now like to invite Joseph uh, Grima on the stage. I first saw Joseph uh, talk publicly actually in Venice, so where he was part of a conversation led by Beatrice Colomina about radical pedagogies. I was really bewitched by uh, uh, his uh, a point of view back then. It was more than 10 years ago. It's also how actually I got to meet Martina, but because it was after that that I invited Space Javier to join us in Romania for the first Arts Biennial in 2015, where we did together uh, a show on um, Sigma pedagogy. So I'm really looking forward to your uh, lecture. Thanks, Oana. Um, it's fantastic to finally be here after 10 years of knowing each other remotely and, um, and to finally have the opportunity also to reflect on some of the topics that have really been in the back of our minds since uh, these, these early uh, expeditions to Romania, thanks to you, um, also with Tamar, I think, at the time, and, um, and being very inspired by the um, uh, Sigma group uh, that was really, uh, when I saw these images of, this, uh, of what was happening in Romania all of these years ago, it seemed like something from the future, in fact. So, Finally, being here in person is uh, a very special experience, and uh, it's, I'm still absorbing the energy of this place and trying to understand a little bit. I think having this tour uh, through the factory this afternoon and having the opportunity to see Faber early today was very helpful in that. Um, my travel here was adventurous, as you know. <laughs> uh, it, was, it, it kind of feels like um, it was necessary to uh, go beyond some kind of test, to pass some kind of test, to uh, be able to be with, uh, with you here this afternoon. Um, and as a result, I came with a very simplified version of my slides, uh, because I had to throw them all together. My, my computer is now currently in an airport in Bucharest somewhere, forgotten on the plane. Um, but in a way, I think that's maybe for the best, because uh, a lot of the things I would have said Saskia has very kindly already said them, so I think it would have been very boring to hear us agreeing with each other publicly. Um, so instead, I'll focus just on a few reflections that were triggered by um, your email, Oana, about what is happening here and your desire and to engage through Martina's uh, curatorial reflections and through all of the workshops and activities that you've been doing on the topic of space as um, specifically understood in, with, through the idea, through the lens of the ruin. Um, first, a few words about myself. I'm, uh, as uh, Oana mentioned, I'm an architect by training. Um, although having studied under Cedric Price, I was heavy, heavily uh, influenced to think about architecture in a very different way from most architects. And um, I kind of feel that I was incredibly lucky probably about 20 uh, years before uh, it became fashionable to be, have been taught that um, it may be a good idea for architects not to default to the idea of building things, uh, which of course is something that's very much in the air now and um, I think is, uh, what gave me a very uh, fortunate head start in, uh, in being able to kind of formulate certain ideas that are, are really very dear to me now and very precious and useful I think today. Um, aside from uh, that, I'm uh, for 10 years now, 2013, um, I founded a practice called Space Caviar that uh, has been very fortunate to collaborate with amazing people over the years, uh, starting with Tamar um, when uh, she was uh, also collaborating with you, but also Martina for many years. We had many adventures together, and I think that um, our practice has really been uh, we're currently based in Milan, in Italy, and um, we, we try to be a little bit like a, a sponge, something that absorbs um, uh, what we consider to be interesting ideas and interesting people and tries to facilitate their work and to, tries to empower them through working together with each other and also as a, almost a form of um, pedagogical practice, I could say. I think for me it's really like being in the school all of the time. Um, and then uh, I'm also, as Saskia mentioned, uh, and also Anna, Creative Director of Design Academy, which is literally a school, uh, and which is a place where the, um, uh, the possibility of seeing into the future is quite literal, because 
as Saskia said, in closing, uh, we're really seeing, I think, a transition in what it means to be a designer. Uh, and as a consequence, schools are struggling to adapt. And that's really one of my biggest challenges as a, uh, a practitioner, is to somehow be able to take something like an institution, Design Academy Eindhoven, a place that has been around now for 75 years and that has a certain um, institutional uh, how can I say, legacy, uh, that means that it's something that's not necessarily particularly agile. And so it's a, a very interesting challenge to be faced with the question of how can an institution that is older than any of the people who teach there uh, or are part of it adapt to a reality that is changing so quickly and that expects such different things from designers from was what, what was expected um, tradition historically. Um, but Aside from all of these things, uh, I would like to actually talk uh, about my uh, other dimension, which is, and which kind of threads a little bit through all of these, which is that of, um, uh, how can I say, um, an addict or a victim, or you could say to some extent of uh, an obsession with ruins. Um, I, it was only actually when your uh, email came, oh, Anna, talking a little bit about the, one of the threads, I think it's one of the threads that runs through Martina's uh, 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 exhibition that uh, we saw here today. Um, but an important one is the question of space, uh, the question of how um, the built environment, the inhabited environment, the inhabited landscape reflects identity and how identity is shaped by this, um, by this fabric. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult question because buildings like these ones around us, they're kind of um, solid, monolithic, monumental. They're not, not designed to adapt particularly um, fast. Uh, and so they have this, this kind of feedback loop, which is something quite interesting to uh, reflect on. And, and the, I, it was... projects have actually taken place inside of ruins. It's like I've become a professional inhabitant of ruins, which I think is actually kind of an amazing thing. I'm very, very, very lucky. Um, where do I point this? Ah, oh, there we go. Oops. Um, but, oops. Huh. I've gone way, way, way too far, far forward. Now, I must say, to begin, that I'm not the first person to be, uh, certainly not the first person in history to be obsessed with ruins. I would say that the obsession with ruins is probably as old as ruins themselves, which is very, very old, obviously. Um, I think that there are certain figures in particular who obviously kind of encapsulate this idea of an interest in the expressive um, possibilities of ruins, even if it's simply on an aesthetic level. Um, Piranesi uh, is an obvious one. Um, Piranesi, who was uh, lived through um, mostly, um, born in 1720, so uh, most influential probably from 1750 on, um, who really, uh, you could say, was certainly not the one to kind of popularize ruins. I think there was uh, all the way back from Vitruvius and uh, long before an interest in the idea of uh, the ruin as a designed object. Uh, but he was certainly one who popularized within the public imaginary um, a certain understanding of the ruin that was very much cl connected to classical architecture, to, to Rome. And as a consequence, possibly his greatest Im invention was tourism as we understand it today, because um, tourism is very, was in, in its kind of current understanding of, uh, of the practice is very much a product of the tradition of the Grand Tour, uh, the idea of going to Italy. Uh, and the idea of going to Italy was very much a product of um, the popularization at a time when the technology of engraving and reproduction was becoming more advanced, certain images that really kind of created a mythology around the idea of the ruin. To the extent that, in fact, in the second half of the 18th century, ruins were in such high demand that buildings couldn't get old enough in time for them to be enough ruins for it to go around, so we had to make artificial ruins, and this is a, a ruin that was uh, actually created, uh, designed as it is, by the um, uh, pr Royal Prince of Liechtenstein in order to embellish his uh, dark wood forest outside of his palace. Um, so, where is the... Um, over there. 
There we are. Um, but the, the idea of uh, the ruin as a, I'm sorry, we went one too many forwards. Uh, Fellini, of course, in 1948, again, um, the uh, Germania no zero, Germany year zero, uh, the year zero after World War II, um, is a film entirely about ruins, and of course it's also, in a way, uh, a film that is intended as a documentary to kind of capture a moment that he, he knew could not last, but that is nevertheless takes all of its power from the architecture, the ruin as an architectural project, the ruin, the consequences of war, as something that at the same time is heavily aestheticized, which is also the case of Gabriele Basilico's um, incredible 1991 project called um, uh, Beirut 1991, uh, where he was one of the first photographers uh, to be let into uh, Beirut following um, the conflict, uh, which completely devastated one of the most beautiful cities of the Mediterranean and left it as this really a Pyrenean scene of uh, ruin, but also of uh, decadent beauty. And this is where I think that um, it's possible to understand the ruin as something that has a, um, an, a, a dimension which many architects and designers have tended to, not simply in aesthetic terms, but also in ideological terms, as something that is, uh, represents uh, a state which is in some ways desirable because a ruin is something that by definition is not possible, fully possible to control. It's the product of not simply human activity, except in the case of the Prince of Liechtenstein, not purely uh, human intention, but also something that runs in parallel to that, which is the action of nature, the action of, um, of, uh, uh, of, of serendipity, of, uh, of unpredictable forces that somehow shape this into, be, into becoming a, um, a, a, a space of possibility that otherwise the city is not. And obviously, uh, one of the greatest expressions of this is Constance New Babylon, a city of uh, drifters, of, uh, of uh, flaneurs, of, uh, of people who move and inhabit spaces on a temporary basis uh, and who are continually adapting to the spaces that they find inside this quote-unquote designed ruin. Uh, and of course, this is also an idea that's very uh, deeply central to the Situationist movement. Uh, Guy Debord, as a philosopher, as Guillaume, as, a, as an artist, uh, actually trying to find within the city um, the possibility of something, spaces that are beyond human control, where uh, that have not been fully infiltrated by capitalism and by a logic of um, uh, 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 determin uh, determinacy of use. Um, and, and all of this simply to say that these were really for me as a student, as an architecture student, were some of my fundamental references. And, um, and it was uh, kind of, look, 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 these were really what for me I kind of found most interesting in architecture uh, was actually not so much the, the, uh, the necessity to produce a certain uh, determinate image, but actually the possibility that architecture could be the product of suggestions that went transcended any single uh, individual's intention or any single individual's lifetime in many cases. Uh, so it happened just after I graduated while I was actually working at Domus magazine. I ended up uh, coming across a open call for participation in the camp for oppositional architecture, which was uh, kind of this event in Berlin that nobody, I didn't, I really had no idea what it was, but I, it sounded kind of interesting, this idea of oppositional architecture, so I um, sent in my application to participate uh, and was accepted and ended up, as a consequence, living for five days inside an abandoned printing press in East Berlin in the Wedding uh, District, uh, together with a bunch of other, um, that's actually me there on the, with my um, uh, sandals on in the first row, Birkenstock way before it was cool, it was ab absolutely not cool at the time, uh, but we, yeah, I mean, we're basically just a bunch of um, of ki mostly of kids just out of uh, uh, out of university living together in this um, in this uh, unused building, and this was actually the uh, sleeping area, uh, which was loud. You can't really see it so much here, but most of the beds were you would kind of bring along your tent and set it up inside the um, inside this uh, this printing factory, on sleeping on top of beer crates. All of this was set up by um, Jesko Fedzer and. Uh, uh, and the group around him who had this group called An Architecture, um, a, 
uh, which was looking towards possibility of a little bit in the spirit of Asger Jorn and, um, uh, and, and the, the, the possibility of spaces that existed outside the logic of um, uh, productivity in an economic sense, a kind of a, a, a sort of supra-capitalist uh, space within uh, a city that by then has, was really kind of taking on a completely different dynamic. Um, and uh, this was Peter Marcuse, who kind of a great uh, uh, sort of um, uh, social urbanist who was the sort of the highlight of uh, uh, speaker of this event. But this, this event somehow triggered in me something that uh, there was something possible inside spaces that were not used, that was not possible anywhere else. It was really kind of like possibly the most important uh, lesson up until then of um, far more important than anything I'd learned in architecture school was this process of spending time in a very intensive way inside spaces um, together with a number of other people without having any specific purpose and without needing to make any sort of permanent intervention. So, then when, we, um, when I started practicing and uh, we set up Space Caviar, I think this is a project that Martina was uh, uh, actually involved in. One of the things that we, um, one of the early projects we worked on was an invitation by the um, uh, Kortrijk Biennale in uh, Belgium uh, to do an exhibition on, this, on the topic of living, of, uh, of, of the home. And they said to us, like, this is a school. The school is going to be completely demolished after the exhibition is over. Do what you like. You, this is your space, um, and that's like for me. I don't think it's, it's happened to me since then, but that was absolutely the best possible uh, exhibition venue that I've ever had, uh, because when the building is about to be demolished, anything is possible. And and so we uh, actually set about uh, con approaching this idea of taking the building as a curator, as a, as a an exhibition in itself um, by making it into uh, a, uh, an opportunity to, to create working groups who would somehow collaborate on um, w uh, doing things uh, inside this building that would never be possible elsewhere. This was a screenshot I just uh, took this morning um, from uh, a post that Jeff Maynard did on Building Blog. Uh, I'd actually forgotten about this part. We did this open call for two teams, Team Derive, um, five people who will construct alternative in routes into and through the building most significantly a new staircase, blah, blah, blah. And then Team Timeline, who will create a graphical layer on top of the existing architecture that offers a unique chronology of domestic space over the last half century. And so taking a more sort of uh, research-based um, approach. Uh, so this was the product of um, Team Derive, um, which was knocking a hole in the side of the building, creating this uh, public access stairway uh, that kind of punched uh, its way in and began an exhibition uh, that la was several hundred meters long that wove through all through the building, through different floors, up through the roof, uh, back um, and across. And this was uh, actually during the sourcing of the, all of the materials for the exhibition were sourced within uh, the building itself and reassembled in order to, to create. Uh, so you can see there the structure of the staircase was coming from the um, parking canopy. Um, several walls were just punched holes what, through uh, the thing that would lead you through the, the thread that was uh, running through the building was the electric Peri Every so often there would be the, the other team that was working on the data layer had uh, made the whole building into one long timeline of the evolution of the idea uh, of the home. And that, uh, all of this time we were living inside the building and operating and, and and making our actions on the building uh, as we were inhabiting it. And, and it's just, uh, it, was, uh, it was an incredible experience of um, understanding a space in a completely different way and having a certain uh, freedom to in intervene on it. Um, and that was kind of the first uh, experiment in this uh, uh, interest in ruins as a canvas um, that one could work with. Uh, a few years later, I was working with um, the uh, New Museum in New York and uh, on a program called Idea City, which was a series of, um, how can I say, intensive um, uh, research residences focused on the, po on the future of the city. Um, and the idea was generally, it was kind of, it began, uh, the idea, the, 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 the kind of embryo of the idea was a conference, the core of the idea was a conference. Uh, but the uh, kind of interest, having uh, had this 
very sort of uh, uh, ongoing interest in the possibility of spaces that were not normally used, uh, we decided um, to actually make it into a, uh, a slightly more extended residency of about three or four days, where a much larger number of people, probably like 30, 40 uh, residents who were again selected through an open call, who could write in from uh, all over the world, would convene in a certain place. We did one in um, Athens, uh, one in uh, Detroit, one in uh, Singapore, various um, places around the world, all under the umbrella of the new museum. And these were some of the infrastructure, this was the infrastructure that we self-built in order to activate this um, former hospital, the, um, the uh, Kiefer Hospital in Detroit, which was a tuberculosis hospital. So disused now for very many years, unlimited number of square meters that could be used, um, and that we were able to activate through a collaboration with Thomas LeMay, open structures, um, the, through the creation of living pods uh, that people would actually be able to uh, inhabit and live um, and, and help to assemble. Um, and so this became a sort of a micro-architecture within the larger landscape of the building itself, uh, with all sorts of different forms. Uh, that could be then demounted and uh, shipped on to the next destination. And this was the kind of the collective uh, living space area, which is kind of crazy when, uh, <laughs> when I look back on it. It's, uh, um, it, it. it's like asking people to actually volunteer to come and live in a space like that for several days altogether. But it, was, it had a certain urgency and sense of um, intensity that I must say is very difficult to rival when, everybody else, when everybody's living in their own sort of hotel rooms and there is a sense of um, uh, a, a collective accomplishment of uh, an, an energy that's only possible in uh, an environment like this. My next ruin uh, project after that, again one that Martina collaborated on, uh, this is actually a structure that I grew up living next to. Um, it's, uh, it was designed by Pierluigi Nervi, who is one of the great Italian engineers and architects of the earliest, early 20th century. And as a kid, I would, on my uh, scooter and then later in my car, I'd be driving backwards and forwards, and I was always deeply impressed by these um, uh, 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 the, the, the paraboloid structures, highly optimized, very advanced use of reinforced concrete. Um, unfortunately, um, and I'd even go in there, at, I'd, I can climb in through the fence to take photographs at night time, because they're just such beautiful sculptural structures. Um, and and that's kind of like the years passed. Eventually, um, funding was received to transform them into a theater in a way that I don't kind of particularly approve of architecturally, but nevertheless, it was good that they could be reused. Um, and so the lower part, the kind of, the, it's not a particularly easy space to use, as you can imagine, given the height of the building. It's a very, very tall building. It was in, it built originally as a silo for chemical products used in agriculture by the Montedison Company. Um, so quite difficult, as you can imagine, seeing something like that. It's not an easy thing to refunctionalize. In fact, it was a modular, um, replicable design that was built all throughout Italy. Um, but anyway, they, they found this way to make it into a, a theater, and it became the theater of the city of Assisi um, in central Italy, where I live. And a lot of theater productions happened there. It was a good thing for the city to have a theater, so everybody was happy. Um, several years later, actually kind of not that long ago, probably the, um, about six or seven years ago, the city of Assisi invited me to come and curate a series of uh, summer uh, festival, you could say, call it a festival, a kind of a cult summer cultural activities between architecture, art, design, uh, and so on and so forth. And the, um, the, the kind of the thread, the, the, the way that we kind of framed this uh, idea of a, a summer convergence in Assisi was also to kind of bring people into spaces that they had a little bit forgotten about. And so it became an opportunity to rediscover certain disused, abandoned spaces that the city itself had really forgotten even existed. And one of these was, uh, turned out to be actually the upper level above the theater of this paraboloid, which had been there all along and uh, everybody had kind of forgotten it even existed. So that became um, the next, uh, my next ruin victim, uh, which 
in collaboration with Martina, and uh, I think I don't, I don't know if it was your year that uh, I think maybe you were uh, working on the previous uh, edition to this one, but we collaborated with the artist Luca Trevisani to make a um, to essentially refunctionalize the space temporarily as a, um, a, 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 a a museum of contemporary art, and he made an incredibly beautiful video wall present uh, installation inside the space and um, I couldn't find, unfortunately, any decent high-res images of the space full, but it was such an incredible uh, thing to see it um, reactivated. Finally, all of this converged um, in uh, more recent years uh, in a, uh, I, I would say, the kind of my ultimate ruin project, which is uh, Alcova. Uh, Alcova is a, uh, a project that I founded together with Valentina Trufi, my partner, and my Alcova partner. Um, in 2017 as a way of somehow applying the same principle that Universa Sisi, this, um, uh, uh, the previous festival I was mentioning, to the field of design within uh, Milan during the uh, design week. And trying to use uh, this incredible influx of people that happens every year uh, during the design week as a way of showing the city to itself, of, uh, of bringing alive spaces that would otherwise be completely uh, forgotten. And this, uh, over the past five years, um, four editions, obviously during the pandemic we had to um, suspend for one. Uh, we've, we started out from a very, very small structure, not much larger than probably this space and a couple of one of the other one next door. Um, which was uh, a former panettone factory where the kind of traditional Milanese cakes were made. Um, and over the years, it's uh, become something of a destination with the design week to the extent that this year we were able to uh, refunctionalize, re reactivate an entire slaughterhouse of um, something like, I don't know, 15 hectares of uh, land, so with, with over uh, four or 5,000 square meters uh, of covered space. Uh, and managed to actually receive, we had 195, 90 something thousand visitors in the space of uh, six days. So like a really uh, extraordinary number of people um, uh, converging on a space that had never before until that point been open to the public um, of Milan. So I'd never set foot in there. These spaces, many of the ones that you see on the left, this, this big tunnel will actually remain, but um, it'll be all kind of cleaned up and, uh, and sorted out, whereas the spaces on the left will all be demolished. So it was also an opportunity. One of our goals with this project, apart from giving a platform to uh, young designers, designers who would not find spaces elsewhere uh, during the design week, is also to give a window um, to the city onto itself, to spaces that otherwise, aside from these kind of initiatives of um, uh, opportunistic refunctionalization, can be quite difficult to, uh, to gain access to. And, and for us, it's like a real job. We have a team of people who actually work on all of the safety, security um, uh, aspects of making sure it's safe to visit a space like this um, and to organize all of the kind of infra infrastructure requirements for this visit. So it's something that's incredibly complicated to do, but that is, in my opinion, of great importance to uh, the city. And uh, this is another view. This was the, f the space that we started in uh, Alcova 2018. Um, and this is one of the ones of uh, 2022. And um, each of these spaces has a long story that I could tell you that's absolutely kind of incredible. And I think it's also what we saw when we came here to visit this space. This space has a story that's incredible. It's somehow each of these spaces, it may appear to be a kind of a, you know, a bare bones industrial space, but each one of them has a story uh, lingering under the surface that is a mirror to the identity of the city, to the place that it, where it is. Um, and of course, the final, <laughs> this I don't think we can qualify it as a ruin, but of course it was a ruin, and I put it in mostly, this is Design Academy Eindhoven in, um, uh, in Eindhoven, uh, in the Netherlands, where Saskia and I work, and Martina as well, Martina as uh, 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 also head of a department. Um, and this is, I think, in a way, uh, I wanted to include this one a little bit because this is the only building that was a formerly former industrial space that was refunctionalized in a permanent fashion. Uh, we're actually being um, uh, 
I, I, evicted is the wrong word. Uh, we, our lease on this building is expiring in 2027. And the unfortunate reality is that uh, we can't afford to renew in the space, even if we wanted to. I mean, we have certain, it's not ideal in, in, in several respects, but even if it was ideal, we would no longer be able to afford to stay in the space. And that's largely, a, paradoxically, a consequence of us being there. And the fact that we actually had invested so much and created an entire generation of designers uh, inside this building means that now the space is far too valuable for it to be able to use to, uh, destined to being a design school. So we also have to be aware of the consequences of what we do in spaces. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why, and I've got, given a lot of thought to this over the years, um, I am all in favor of uh, an agile and itinerant refunctionalization of space. I'm not particularly in favor of uh, I, I wouldn't say that I'm not in favor of it. I prefer the uh, flexibility and agility and indeterminacy of spaces that, uh, in which we take a light touch uh, over the ones where we kind of put down deep roots and become uh, rooted in a specific part of the city. Because even if we end up not being kicked out ourselves and if we've done our planning right, then we don't, it does have uh, an impact on the neighborhood around it. And that can be a good thing. It's not to say that it's necessarily a bad thing. It's, in, in many instances, that can be good. But we still, it, it probably is going to mean in the long term that we're not going to be able to have the full um, uh, spectrum of the, the full opportunity that, uh, that spaces of, um, that, uh, of a different nature offer. And, uh, I wanted to actually end, let's see, ah, this is, yeah, this is just one more for, <laughs> uh, this was in 1980 actually, just going back to the topic of uh, Design Academy Eindhoven's building, uh, in 1980 a protest when uh, Philips was gradually moving out of the city, uh, actually the Lichtor and the, the, the building to the right, this is Design Academy is that uh, one there, uh, and to the right is the Lichtor and that was actually squatted by protesters who were, uh, um, for very good reasons, displeased at um, Philips kind of downsizing, moving out, out of Eindhoven. Um, and that was when the, mo the moment when the uh, building became uh, available to the, um, to the academy as a sort of a second life to a building that had been designed for and used at, until that point for uh, industrial purposes. And that's a poster, uh, a super beautiful poster. I actually just found that today. I hadn't seen it before of the... Uh, they produced to commemorate the squatting of the Lechtoren. I found this quote from uh, Ruskin. This was actually why I called it the law of ruin because um, uh, Ruskin uh, wrote in his, um, uh, uh, in one, one, one of several treatises on architectural composition, um, he wrote something quite beautiful about ruins. Um, the, the, the law that we should, as architects, be governed by the law of ruins um, in the sense that we should be designing buildings not so much for when they're new and when they're kind of, uh, when we're using them ourselves for the purposes that we intend them, them to be used for, but thinking about the future uh, and thinking about how these buildings will be of value to someone when they're ruins, when they're no longer being used for their intended purpose. And I think that there's something, uh, it, it, there are two aspects to that. There's one, one is that this is a way of thinking that is completely unthinkable within the framework of um, a capitalist economy because the capitalist economy doesn't think, it, it, it thinks about quarterly returns. It doesn't think, certainly doesn't think about uh, long-term decades into the future, or even maybe centuries or millennia into the future. Within the framework of, um, uh, of a capitalist market economy, investment in the future is something that's incredibly difficult to do. So we often talk about capitalism as uh, uh, the problem of capitalism being the production of inequality. I think the most uh, uh, absolutely reprehensible and regrettable form of inequality that, that it produces is the inequality between us and the opportunity that we have today and the, and, and the, and the future generations. We are leaving nothing behind. We're leaving, on the, on the other hand, a kind of a completely predatory uh, extractivist wasteland that we have consumed as opposed to a logic in which we are designing ruins that are going to be useful for, uh, for future generations. 
And conversely, I think there's something incredibly beautiful about the idea of a generous architecture, an architecture that is actually attempting to create possibilities that even itself can't predict. And this idea that uh, men will say as they look upon the labor and wrought substance of them, see, this, father, this our fathers did for us, apart from all of the gender uh, problems with sen these sentences, I think there's something very beautiful and inspiring in there. And so when we look at these statistics and these analyses of what this place is today, uh, what this region is today, what the city is, we look at indicators such as um, productivity, we look at the economy, uh, and then we kind of end up defaulting towards this idea that we need, what we need is more growth. Uh, I think on the contrary, it would be interesting to think about a little bit like with Martina we were talking, saying this morning, how uh, uh, Romania for all of its uh, disadvantages in infrastructural terms, of which for sure there are many, uh, has actually been able to create certain advantages in terms of, for example, the implementation of new technologies like mobile networks and, um, and communications infrastructure because it's all the thing of the latest generation. It's looked towards the future. It didn't go and kind of install fax machines because you have to go through all of the... It's kind of the, the typical sort of uh, leapfrog discourse. What I think the opportunity here, what is at stake, is the opportunity to be leapfrogging to the kind of architectural production, infrastructural production, urbanistic production that everybody else is going to be thinking about necessarily in 20 or 30 years because there's no two ways, there's no other choice. We are going to have to fundamentally rethink around the logic of reuse, around the logic that does not just build as the first response to any possible need, but that actually thinks about how we can reuse what we have already in a way that doesn't compromise its um, utility for future generations. And it would be much more interesting to think of Romania as uh, an ambitious, forward-looking, um, pioneering uh, landscape, urban landscape, than to simply copy all of the mistakes we're already making everywhere else in Europe and the world. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you. So here we are in this reality that Norbert so precisely described earlier. And also here we are, creatives, mostly dreamers, idealists. And my question for you for the next part of the program is how do these two worlds actually collide or connect or deliver for each other for now and, both, and for the future? Uh, what I suggest is that we take a 10 minutes break and then we recalibrate for the talk um, that will be moderated by Stefan Gentulescu and that will also be joined by uh, Mihaela Sikim from um, our uh, partner in Hamilton uh, representing industry today, but also Simona Fitz, who's the advisor on culture uh, for the mayor. Because basically what we are doing now and what we have been doing throughout these years is a lot of cultural content, uh, which I am really curious um, about its impact, its relevance, and how we can design it better for the future. So let's have a short break and come back to that. <laughs> 